Virginia Conference, it is great to see you. Those of you who are joining us by way of live streaming, uh, as well as those of you who are present, I missed you. And we uh, are grateful that we were able to come back. Uh, this is our first uh, opportunity to share with the Virginia Conference since General Conference. So I'm celebrating the fact that they sent me back uh, to ha hang out with you guys for another three years, man. And uh, I am blessed by this reassignment. And I ask that you continue to pray for us because it's my intention that we run through the tape. Uh, we're not going to coast over the rest of this quadrennium. We're going to press our way because as great as things are, and they are good, we really thank God for all that the Lord is doing in the Virginia Conference. But there is still more that we need to do. I want to celebrate all of the leaders in our local churches for what they're doing. I want to also congratulate uh, Sister um, uh, Cynthia, who was reelected our Connectional Lay Council Treasurer. Let's thank God for her, Cynthia White. Amen. And uh, thankful for the way in which the Virginia Conference still continues to make great impact for Zion. I'll share more in a bit, but let's get into the Word of God. And I prayed about what did I feel the Lord would have me to say to the ordinance in our conferences this year. You are being ordained an elder in the Lord's church at a historic time in the church. Historic. While there have been pandemics before, while there has been social dis-ease before, while there has been financial distress before, rarely do we find them coming if, with the ferocious ferocity and the intensity <coughs> simultaneously. And it's coming at the very time that the church is shifting. The church is not declining contrary to what popular opinion says. In fact, polls indicate that people are seeking spiritual depth now as much as at any time in American history. So the church is not declining, but the church is shifting. And as the church shifts, unfortunately, some of our congregations and some of our leaders are not discerning the times. Like the tribe of Ishakar, you've got to be able to discern what's happening in the broader culture and not change the gospel but adjust to the reality of a new culture. And there are some leaders who are stuck in a 1950s Ford when we are in a Tesla generation. And there are some churches that are hoarders rather than allowing God to transform us. You know about hoarders? Anything they ever had, they keep. Which means they're keeping both treasure and trash. And the key to being impactful in ministry in 2021 is to be able to discern what is treasure and should be retained and what is trash and should either be rejected or recycled. But it takes wisdom to do that. And so I've been praying about what is it that the Lord wants me to say to you 
who will be ordained today. And the Lord came to an obscure text in a rarely read book in the Bible. Let's go to the book of Nahum, Old Testament. Those of you who are using old-fashioned printed Bibles <laughs> need to get to the major prophets, uh, Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel, Daniel, and then make a right-hand turn and keep going until you get through Micah, and then you will find Nahum. I know it's in the section in your Bible where the pages stick together because we don't do a whole lot of reading out of, Mike, out of Nahum. Uh, for those of you that are using your smartphones, <laughs> it's easy to get to Nahum. All right. Nahum chapter 1, and I just want to read one verse. Verse 7. I'm reading from the New Standard New Revised Standard Version, Nahum chapter 1, verse 7. The Lord is good, a stronghold in a day of trouble. He protects those who take refuge in him. Now, the King James Version would use the same language, except it at the end of verse 7, it says, he knoweth them that trust in him. I want to speak for a few minutes from the subject, in God we trust. God grant that anointing that makes preaching possible, that makes preaching practical, that makes preaching personal, that makes preaching purposeful, but most of all, that makes preaching powerful. In the matchless, marvelous, magnanimous name of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, we pray. Let us all say again, amen. He knoweth them that trust in him. Beloved, one of the challenges that we all face is that which we see the most we tend to take for granted. Uh, things can be so uh, common that they eventually become invisible. And one of the things is with currency, prior to Bitcoin and Cash App and uh, uh, PayPal and all of the digital ways we do transactions, uh, using a bill, whatever the denomination may be, 5, 10, 20, became so common that very few of us, if we're quizzed, can tell you all of the language or the graphics on any particular bill. But the one phrase that all of us, if reminded, are immediately aware of is the phrase, in God we trust. Every one of our currencies have, in God we trust, imprinted on it. But it wasn't always that way. In fact, the first uh, coin that it was printed on was a two-cent coin. So when you literally were giving somebody your two cents, <laughs> uh, you were saying, in God we trust. It's interesting that the phrase in God we trust was actually added to the coin, the two cent coin, during the Civil War. And it was upon the recommendation of a minister out of Pennsylvania who wrote the then Secretary of Treasury and said, whether we win this war or lose this war, but especially if we win this war, we need to be reminded that it was not our military might that gave us the victory. We need to be reminded in all that we do that the only reason we are who we are and we can achieve what we achieve is because of God. It is not by might. It is not by power. But it is by God's spirit. And so, therefore, the Secretary Treasurer, Treasury for the United States, uh, Secretary uh, Salmon Chase, 
was his name, uh, directed that all of the two cent coins would now have in God we trust imprinted on it. Eventually, all of the currency did that. Well, isn't it an important reminder that if there are any battles that we win, it's because of God? Isn't it important to remember that if there's any positions we attain, it's because of God? Isn't it important to be reminded even the very money that we get? Ultimately, if it wasn't for the Lord, we would not have the strength or the ability to get what we have. Everything that we have, everything that we are, and everything that we shall become, it is because of God. Now, there is nobody listening to me this morning who would disagree with that. But let me go deeper. Because while you agree with me, here's my question. How many of us really, truly trust God? Now, we say in God we trust. We say that the only reason I'm preaching is not because I'm so wonderful, not because I'm so perfect, not because I haven't messed up, not because of my connections and my contact, but it is because of God and God's grace. The car you drive, the house you live in, the degree that you have, the family that you have, everything you have, you testify to the fact if it had not been for the Lord on my side where will we be? Isn't that what we believe? Isn't that what we say? Well then do our actions align with our verbiage? Do we really mean what we say? Because if we really meant what we said then it means we never should have to engage in manipulation in order to get ahead. We never should have to engage in conspiracies and plotting in order to get ahead. If we mean what we say, it means that we're not who we are because of uh, some scheme we came up with. Or some agenda that we have. How can we say we trust in God and yet we are always trying to work behind the scenes to advance ourselves rather than let God do what God is going to do with our lives? How many of us have gotten into alliances with people just so that we can get ahead. How many of us think it's because of the backroom deals? The trading off. That your hand, one hand washes the other hand. That you're able to advance. Well, here's what happened. Uh, back in 2005, in Virginia, in fact, uh, federal Appeals Court got a case, uh, Pastor Conway, that said, in God we trust is a violation of the separation of church and state. Because an atheist said, the government should not put out anything that says, in God we trust. Here's what the uh, fourth... Circuit Court of Appeals wrote, when you see in God we trust on the coins and on currency, it doesn't really mean anything. Let me quote what the judge says. In God we trust on a government building or on currency does not violate the separation of church and state because in God we trust is a 
patriotic and ceremonial motto with no theological or practical impact. Are you hearing me? It's saying it's rhetoric, but no reality. That you can spend the money, but you don't really mean in God you trust. That this is just a part of our rhetoric as being Americans. Now, that may be true about the government. But what concerns me is that it has also become true about believers. About those of us who claim to be Christians. We use language, but we don't really mean it. We say we trust in God, but instead we trust in our abilities. We trust in who we know. We trust in our political stance. We trust in our contest. We trust in the money on which the motto is placed. So at the end of the day, it's show me the money. Can't tell you how many times pastors will say to me when I'm uh, offering them uh, an appointment, well, what's the package? You know why? Because they trust what the budget says and don't trust God. We say we trust God will make a way, but we got to see how he's going to make a way first. We say we trust that God is going to open doors, but we won't move in the direction of the doors unless the Lord first puts the keys in our hands. We say that we know that God will make a way out of no way, but we need to see the roadmap and the itinerary even before we get started. I want to challenge you who are coming for ordination. Do you trust God? Do you trust God? Don't fall on your knees and go through a ceremony if there's no commitment in your heart. The book of Nahum is, uh, it's not for the timid or the, the weak hearted because uh, that's one of the reasons why people don't preach from Nahum much because because it's a it's, it's a strong book uh, they, it uses graphic language and uh, it's pretty difficult to hear uh, but I want you to know that although it's difficult it's to shake us out of our complacency. God knows I don't have time this morning to deal with it. But the danger of this culture that you are called to preach in is that everybody wants to be coddled. Everybody wants to feel at ease and nobody wants to be challenged. In fact, if you do challenge people, they think that you're a hater. But the fact of the matter is, we don't grow if we're not challenged. Uh, God, uh, I'm really, I'm trying to, to focus this, but it's so important to understand. It's one of the reasons why I was sharing with presiding of the crowd on the way over here. I celebrate the fact that our churches are learning how to adapt to technology in order to reach people virtually and live streaming. We got to do it. And even once we are through this dangerous time with COVID and the Delta variant, we've got to incorporate technology in our ongoing ministry. Now, not only is it important to have a quality minister of music, it's important to have a quality director of technology. When you meet with your ministry team, it's got to include your minister of music, the head of your ushers, your preacher steward, and the one who's running your AB and your live streaming department. You need consecrated technicians in this process. That's a part of our ministry going forward. But here's the danger. The danger is that people will become so comfortable watching live streaming that they feel there's no need to press your way to get into the sanctuary. Because they're saying, I can do it from home. 
I can lay in my bed. I can sit in my pajamas. I can sip on my coffee. I can eat my toast. I can watch while I'm having a muffin. I can have my slippers on and my shorts on and I can engage in worship. Yes, that's better than no worship. But we never should totally replace the gathering together of ourselves. And so in now and then I watch live streaming. That's great. But I ought to have a yearning in my spirit to get in to the presence of God's people. But there's a deep reason about this. There's a deeper reason about this. It is because we're living in an age where we want everything to be convenient for us. God, no. I'm going to have to do more teaching on this at LTI. But we have turned worship into what works for us. So I want everything to be convenient. I don't want to be uncomfortable. I don't want to sit in a service too long. I don't want to have to stay awake. If I'm watching live streaming, I can take a nap. If I'm, if I'm watching live streaming, I don't have to worry about putting clothes on and driving and going out of my way. If I'm watching live streaming, I can flip and go from one service to when the other one is too boring and the sermon is too long. I can go from one. Why? Because it's no longer about what grows me. It's not, no longer about me making a sacrifice. It's what's convenient to me. So we've turned into Netflix. We want just Netflix and chill. But do this for me. And like I said, I'll do more teaching at LTI on this. Go through worship in scripture. Find any time that worship is about the worshiper and did not involve sacrifice. Start in Genesis chapter 22, the first place that worship is mentioned, and Isaac was being offered as a sacrifice by Abraham. He had to prepare for worship. And then there's the Psalms of degrees, because they had to prepare to reach the high and holy place. Now we want to press a button and watch worship in front of us. There is some benefit to being in the midst of folk that rub you the wrong way. And you who are about to become elders in the church, hear me, it is a weak leader who only wants to surround themselves with people that make you feel comfortable. There will be people who will rub you the wrong way. But just like sandpaper, you want to keep them around. Because if they rub you the wrong way, they are helping to smooth out some of the rough places in your life. If I had members that agreed with me on everything I said, then I wouldn't be where I am. Because having some that rub me the wrong way caused me to pray sometimes. Caused me to seek God's face sometimes. Taught me patience. Gave me wisdom. Wisdom. So stop being a weak leader that only wants to surround yourself with clones and is already quick to fire anybody because they have the nerve to have their own mind. That's not a sign of strength. It's a sign of weakness. The text says eh, I'm getting ready to tell you some rough things. That's what Nahum is saying. But let me just quickly make it in your notes, uh, Pastor Turns. You know the word Nahum means comforter? God. Getting ready to tell you some rough things. The prophet whose name means comfort. Because comfort does not mean coddle. Comfort does not mean convenience. Comfort is actually a compound word, C-O-M, com, which means alongside, and fort, from the word fortify. So to really be comforted is not to lull people into convenience, 
but it's to come alongside of them so that they become stronger. You want to know the sign of a real leader? Are your members stronger in their faith today than when you first showed up? Are your members growing in their walk with Christ? Because Nahum, which means comfort, became the prophet by which they name the village Capernaum. I got some Bible readers here. And the Bible readers will tell you Capernaum became Jesus' headquarters. <laughs> I preach myself happy sometimes. Uh, that Jesus said, I'm going to make my headquarters named after the prophet who spoke so much truth that it disturbed people, but it put them to a place that they became stronger because of the process. Capernaum was Jesus' headquarters. So here's what the prophet says, and I'll take my seat. Here's what the prophet says. The prophet says, the Lord is good. No, y'all, you missed it. I, I really could have just stopped the sermon right there. The Lord is good. Uh, don't, I, I, I just want to do a check. Anybody can know for themselves that the Lord is good. Uh, actually, actually, if I was a Baptist preacher, I would just go into hooping uh, that part and just say, the Lord is good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then just based on the emphasis, you could put your emphasis on the Lord is good. Uh, meaning that there's only one. Uh, uh, you could say, put your emphasis on the Lord is good. Uh, emphasizing that he's the one in charge. You can put your emphasis on the is the Lord is good. Uh, because not only was he good and not only shall he be good, but he right now is good. You can put your emphasis on the Lord is good. Why? Because I want you to know in spite of what you may have to deal with, the Lord is good. And I do need you to understand, Reverend Johnson, uh, uh, that the Lord is good is both descriptive and prescriptive. Somebody say, hey, preach, Bishop. Uh, I'm doing the best that I can. Uh, uh, it is descriptive because it describes who he is. The Lord is good, but it's prescriptive to let you know no matter what you're going through, I can tell you how it's going to turn out because the Lord is good. If you're going through something right now, you need to affirm in your spirit, the Lord is good. In other words, he's too good not to be with me in the midst of my sickness, in the midst of storm in the midst of my sorrow. Do I have just five or six witnesses up in here that could testify what I was going through what good, what I was feeling what good, what I was dealing with what good, how I was hurting what good. But I want you to know, even in the midst of all of it, I can testify the Lord is good. Somebody ought to shout, I know that's right. Would you just, I know you can't touch your neighbor, but would you just look them in the eye and say, the Lord is good. I dare you, I dare you to praise him for his good. I dare you to let the enemy know, I don't have all the money I want. I, I don't have all the good that I want. I don't have all of the friends that I need. But I thank God that the Lord is good. Here, the Lord is good. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. For the Lord is good and his mercy endureth to all generations. Somebody shout, the Lord is good. Uh, uh, can, I, can you pray with me just one more minute? Uh, because not only is the Lord good, uh, but the text also helps us to understand that the Lord is up to something. The reason I can say the Lord is good is because he's a stronghold. 
in the day of trouble. Uh, Dr. Jones, it lets me know that there's going to be trouble. Can you say that with me? There's going to be trouble. Come on, you ought to say it emphatically. There's going to be trouble. Uh, we got to stop this name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, too anointed to be disappointed, kind of cotton candy religion where all you want is sweetness with no substance. The fact of the matter is man that is born of a woman is but a few days and those are full of trouble. There's going to be trouble. Listen, I don't have to be a prophet and you don't need to get in line and give me a hundred dollar seed offering for me to make a prophecy about your future. You go and cry again. Let me just tell you, let me, let me be a prophet. Let me be, use the blessed handkerchief. You go and have some struggle. shout it comes with the territory we got to stop telling people that the reason they're going through trouble is because they're outside of the will of God can I help you understand you can be in the will of God and still have hardship to still have struggle but here's what the text says that he is a stronghold in the time of trouble. So here's what I, I was wrestling with. So I did my homework, Pastor Chris Eason. I did my homework. I, I did some etymological investigation. And I checked on the, uh, the history of the word stronghold. And uh, here's the definition You've been waiting for. You know what a stronghold is? Is when the Lord holds you strong. <laughs> I know you wanted something really profound. Uh, but, a, but a stronghold means uh, the Lord is going to hold you strong. And will you do this for me? Just take your hand and ball it up in a fist. I, as strong as your hold is. Your hold doesn't compare to the hold of the Lord. So when presiding Elder Jones walked in the office and said, how you doing, Bishop? And I said, I'm holding on. And he said, that's good to hear. And I said, but better than that, and not only am I holding on, I'm being held on too. Because can I testify, there are times when you hold on, but your grip is not strong enough to hold in the midst of the storm. And so you got to know that not only are you being, you holding on, but God is holding on to you. I had our grand, we had our grandchildren with us this summer and we were out at the beach and I, my granddaughter, Jaylee, five years old, she uh lives in Chicago, so she's not used to ocean water, uh, but she loves the ocean. And we were out in the water, and my, my wife is saying, don't go too far. Don't go too far. Don't go too far. Don't go. And I understand you got to be safe with a five-year hole. So we didn't go but a few steps. To, uh, Pastor turns from the, the shore, but as we went out, soon uh, uh, Jaylee was holding on to me, and a wave came uh, that came around her neck. And she became fearful for a moment. She was holding my hand. Uh, I got back to shore. Uh, uh, her mama said, Jaylee, did you hold tight to Papa? And she said, yeah, Mama, I was holding Papa tight. And uh, she said, so you didn't feel afraid holding on to Papa when the wave came? And Jaylee said, I wasn't afraid because I was holding on tight to Papa, but Papa was holding on tight to me. Is there a witness in the building? Uh, I feel I preach right 
now. Anybody ever have the waves of trouble come your way? Anybody have the waves of sorrow come your way? Anybody have the waves of grief come your way? Anybody have the waves of financial problem come your way? Anybody have the waves of sickness come your way? But I've come to tell you uh, that the Lord is holding on uh, to his people. So preach anyhow. Uh, whether they say amen or not, keep on preaching because the Lord has his hands uh, on you. Uh, I remember the old folk used to say, I know the Lord uh, has laid his hands uh, on me. Is there a witness in the building? Uh, hold on to his hands uh, but God has his hands on you come on and give God some major praise in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit in God we trust